Live from San Francisco, California, it's theCUBE. Covering the IBM Chief Data Officer Summit. Brought to you by IBM. We're back at Fisherman's Wharf covering the IBM Chief Data Officer event, the 10th anniversary. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. Just off the keynotes, Martin Schroeder is here as the Senior Vice President of IBM Global Markets, responsible for revenue, uh, profit, IBM's brand, just a few important things. Martin, welcome they're to theCUBE. They're important, they're important. Inder Paul Bandari, uh, CUBE alum, uh, uh, Global Chief Data Officer at IBM. Good to see you again. Good to see you, Dave. So you guys are just off the, the keynotes. Uh, Martin, you talked a, a lot about uh, disruption, uh, things like digital trade that we're going to get into, digital transformation. Uh, what are you hearing when you talk to, to clients? You spent a lot of time as the CFO. I did. Now you're spending a lot of time with clients. What are they telling you about disruption and digital transformation? Yeah, you know, the interesting thing, Dave, is the, the first thing that every CEO starts with now is that I run a technology company. And it doesn't matter if they're, okay. you know, they're writing code or if they're manufacturing corrugated cardboard boxes. Every CEO <laughs> believes they are running a technology company. Now, interestingly, Maybe we could have predicted this already five or six years ago because we run a CEO survey, we run CFO, we run right. suite sur surveys of the C-suite. And already about five years ago, technology was number one on the CEO's list of what's going to change their company in the next three to five years. It lagged, it, 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 it led, it, the CFO lagged, the CMO lagged, everyone else like CEO saw it first. So CEOs now believe they are running technology businesses. And then when you run a technology business, that means you have to fundamentally change the way you work, how you work, who does the work, and how you're finding and reaching and engaging with your clients. So, so when we talk, you know, we shorthand of digitizing the enterprise, or what does it mean to become a digitally enabled enterprise? It really is about how do you use today's technology embedded into your workflows to make sure you don't get disintermediated from your clients and you're bringing them value at every step, every touch point of, uh, of their journey. So that brings up a, a point. Every CEO I talk to is trying to get digital right. And that comes back to the data. Now you're, of course, biased on that, but, but <laughs> what are your thoughts on a digital business? Is digital business is all about how they use data and, and leverage data. What does it mean to get digital right, in your view? So data has to be the starting point. You actually do see examples of companies that'll start out on a digital transformation or a technology transformation, and then eventually back into the data transformation. So in a sense, you've got to have the digital piece of it, which is really you know, the experience that users have of the products of the company, as well as the technology, which is kind of the back-end engines that are running, but also the workflow, and being able to infuse AI into workflows, and then data, because everything really rides on the data being in good enough shape to be able to pull all this off. So eventually people realize that really it's not just a digital transformation or a technology transformation, but it is a data transformation to begin with. And, and you guys have talked a lot at this event, at least this, this pre-event, I've talked to people about operationalizing AI. That's a big part of your responsibilities. How do you feel about where you're at? I mean, it's a journey I know, you're never done, but feel like you're making some good progress there? Internally well, at IBM, yes, specifically. Yes, inter internally at IBM, very good progress. Because our whole goal is to infuse AI into every major business process and touch every IBM. So that's the, that's the whole goal of what we've been you know, doing for the last few years. And uh, we're already at the stage where our central AI and data platform uh, for this year, over 100,000 active users will be making use of it on a regular basis. So we think we're in, you know, pretty far along in terms of our transformation and the whole goal behind this summit and the previous summits, as you know, Dave, has, to be, has been to use that as a showcase for our clients and customers so that they can replicate that journey as well. So, we heard Ginny Rometty uh, two IBM thinks ago talk about incumbent disruptors, yes. which is, resonates, because IBM's an incumbent disruptor. Uh, you talked about uh, chapter one being random acts of digital, um, and then chapter two is sort of how to take that, that right. mainstream. So what do you see as the next wave, Martin? Well, as, as Interpol said, and if I use us as an example, now, we are using AI heavily. We have an advantage, right? We have this thing called IBM Research, one of the most prolific inventors of things, still leads the world, you know, we still lead the world in patents, so we have right. the benefit. For our clients, however, we have to help them down that journey. And, and, and the clients today are on a journey of, of uh, finding uh, the right hybrid cloud solution that gives them 
bridges sort of, I have this data, the incumbency advantage of having data, along with where are the tools and where's the compute power that I need to take advantage of the data. So they're on that journey. At the same time, they're on the journey, as Interpol said, of embedding it into their workflows. So for IBM, the, the company that's always lived sort of at the intersection of technology and business, that's what we're helping our clients do today, helping them take their, their incumbent advantage of data, having data, helping them co-create, or working with them to co-create solutions that they can deploy, and then helping them put that into work, into, into, into production, if you will, in their, in their environments and in their workflows. So one of the things you stressed today, two, two of the things, you talk about uh, transparency and open digital trade. I want to get into the latter, but, but think, talk about what's important in chapter two, just what are those ingredients of, of success? You talked about things like free flow of data, prevent data lo localization, mandates, and, and protect algorithms and right. source codes. You also made another statement which is very powerful. IBM has never given up its source code to a government and we'd leave the country first. Yes, we wouldn't so, give up our source code. So what are some of those success factors that we need to be thinking about in that context? Yeah, so I mean, let's, let's if, we, if we look at IBM, IBM today runs you know, 87% of the world's credit card transactions, right? IBM today runs the world's banking systems. Mm -hmm. We run the airline reservation systems. We run the supply chains of the world. Hearts and lungs, right? If I just shorthand all of that, hearts and lungs. The reason our clients allow us to do that is because they trust us at the very core. If they, if they didn't trust us with their data, they wouldn't give it to us. If they didn't trust us to run the process correctly, they wouldn't give it to us. So when we say trust, it, it happens at a very uh, at a very base level of who do you really trust to run your data, and importantly, who is someone else going to trust with, with, your, with, your, uh, with your data, with your systems. Any bank can maybe figure out you know, how, to, how to run a little bit of a process, but you need scale, that's where we come in, so big banks need us, and secondly, you need someone you can trust that can get into the global banking system, because the system has to trust you as well. So they trust us at a very base level, that's why we still, as I said, we still run the hearts and lungs of the enterprise world. Yeah, and you also made the point, you're not talking about necessarily personal data, that's not right. your business, but when you talked about the free flow of data, uh, there are, governments of many, Western governments who are sort of putting in this mandate of not being able to persist data out of the country. But then you gave an example of, if you're trying to track a bag, you know, a baggage claim, you actually want that free data. flow of data. Yeah, yeah. So, so what are those conversations well, yeah, like? Yeah, so first I do think we have, to, we have to distinguish between the kinds of data that should flow freely and the kinds of data that should absolutely be. Personal information is not what we're talking about, mm -hmm. right? But the supply chains of the world work on data. The banking system works on data, right? So, so when we talk about the data that has to flow, flow freely, it's all the data that doesn't have a, a, uh, a, a good reason for it to stay local. Citizens' data, healthcare data might have to stay because they're protecting their citizens' privacy. Th that's the issue I think that most governments are on. So we have to disaggregate the, the, the data discussion, the free flow of data from the privacy issues, which are very important. Mm -hmm. Is there a gray area there between the personal information and the type of data that, that Martin's talking about, or is it pretty clear cut in your view? No, I, I think it, this has obviously got to play itself out, right? But I'll give you one example. So, the whole use of a blockchain potentially helps you address and find the right balance between privacy of sensitive data versus uh, you know, actually the free flow of data. Right. right. So for instance, you could have an encryption or a hashtag, or a hash, sorry, not a hashtag, a hash of say the person's name uh, whose luggage is lost. And you could pass that information through and then on the other side it's decrypted and you, then you, you're able to make sure that, you know, essentially you're able to satisfy the client, the customer. And there's, so there's flow of data, there's no issue with regard to exposure because only the rightful parties are able to use it. So these things are, in, in a sense, the technologies that we're talking about, that Martin talked about, you know, with the blockchain and so forth, they, they are in place to be able to really revolution, revolutionize and transform digital trade. But there are other factors as well. With, with, and Martin touched, touched on a bunch of those in the, in the keynote with regard to you know, the imbalances, some of the protectionism that comes in and so on and so forth, which all that stuff has to be played through. So much to talk about, so little time. So digital trade, let's, let's digital get into trade. that a little bit. What is that and why is it so important? So if you look at the, the, the economic throughput in the digital economy, the size of the GDP, if you will, 
of what travels around the world and the way data flows, it's greater than the traded goods flow. So this is a very mm. important discussion. Over the last 10 years, you know, out of the out of the hundred percent of jobs that were created, eighty percent or so had a digital a digital uh, uh, component to it, which means that the next set of jobs that we're creating they are they require digital skills, right? So, so we need uh, a set of skills that we're going that that will uh, an, a, enable a, a workforce, right? And we need a regulatory environment that's cooperative, that, that's supportive. So in the regulatory environment, as I, as I we, we said before, we think data should flow freely unless there's a reason for it not to flow. And, and I think there will be some really good reasons why certain data should not flow. But data should flow freely, except for, for certain reasons uh, uh, that are important. We need, uh, we need to make sure that we don't create a series of mandates that force someone to store data here. Right? If you want to be in, if you want to be in, 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 in business in a country, the country shouldn't say, well, if you want to do business here, you have to store all your data here. It tends to be done on the auspice of a security concern, but we've, we know enough about security to know that doesn't help. It's a false sense of security. So data has to flow freely. Don't make someone store it there just because it may be moving through or, or is being processed in your country. And then thirdly, we have to protect the source code uh, uh, that companies are using. We cannot force, no country can for, should force a, a company to give up their source code. People will leave, they just won't do business there. That, that's so, just talking about an intellectual property yeah. issue there, right? It's uh, huge obviously. intellectual property issue, yeah, that's yeah, exactly so, right. So the public policy framework then is, is really free, free flow of data yes. where it makes sense. Um, uh, no mandates, unless it makes sense, right? A a and um, and protection of IP. Protection of IP. That's right. it. Okay. Good. It's pretty. It's a pretty simple structure, and and based on my discussions, I think most most sort of al align with that, and we're encouraged. I'm encouraged by what I see in TPP. It has that. What I see in in Europe. It has that. What I see in USMCA. It has that. So all three yeah. of those are very good, but they're three separate things. We need to bring it all together to have one. So those are good examples. GDPR maybe is a framework that seems to be seeping its way into other. Yeah. So GDPR areas. is a, is an important discussion, but that's the privacy discussion yes, right. wrapped around a broader trade issue, right? But privacy is important. GDPR does a good job on it, but we have a broader trade issue of data. All right, Andrew Paul, we'll give you the final word. It's kind of your show. Oh, no, so I was just going to say, Dave, I think one way to think about it is you have to have the free flow of data. Mm -hmm. And maybe the way to think about it is certain data you do need controls on, and it's more the form in which the data flows that you restrict as opposed to letting the data flow at all. What do you mean? Right? So the hash example that yeah. I gave you, it's okay for the hash to go, th go across, but that way you're not exposing uh, the data itself. So, so th th those technologies are all there. It's much more the regulatory frameworks that Martin's talking about, that they've got to be there and in place so that we are not impeding the progress. That's going to be inevitable when you do have the free flow. So in that instance, the, the hash example that you gave, it's the parties that are adjudicating, the machines are adjudicating. Yep. Unless the parties want to expose that data, it won't be exposed. It won't happen. It won't, yeah. it, they, won't be right. you know, they won't be exposed. All right, Interpol. Martin, I know you got to run. Thanks so much for Thank coming you. on theCUBE. Thanks for the Appreciate it. You. You're welcome. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest from IBM CDO Summit in San Francisco. You're watching theCUBE.